Good day. I'm Chad Stebbins from the Institute of International Studies, and it's my pleasure to introduce our Australian speaker this morning, J.J. Wolfe, who comes to us from Australia via Los Angeles. So this is going to be a great talk this morning on the customs, culture, and food from the land down under. And I do want to give you the event code if you're taking the survey at the end of the event to enter into a $1,000 drawing for a study abroad grant. Uh, you can find the, the QR code and the URL inside the Oceana Semester brochure. So the event code is 5608, and you could take the survey at the conclusion of the presentation. So, very delighted to have J.J. Wolf here. He's known for bringing the taste of Australia to the United States through his Aussie Pies and Sausages website. And this event is on Facebook Live. Uh, I'm impressed, the first one we've ever had on Facebook Live. And you could follow that on J.J. Wolf Pie. J-A-Y, J-A-Y, Wolf Pie, if you want to uh, follow it live on Facebook. So, JJ grew up in Melbourne, where the meat pies and sausages were always within easy reach. He had a 20-year career manufacturing women's and children's clothing that I suspect was less than satisfying. Uh, he ultimately decided to do a complete career change and he discovered that his passion was in the kitchen rather than manufacturing clothing and the, you know, the world of retail. So he, he was in L.A. and he missed Aussie food, football, and the friendliness and humor of his mates and, and launched this new business in 2017. Uh, he started making meat pies and sausage rolls and shipping them anywhere in the United States. And I've placed orders with him. He can ship them to Joplin. Uh, they're very, very good. Now, if you come back uh, tomorrow at noon, court in this same place, you'll be able to sample his meat pies for free. If you come to Third Thursday tonight, downtown Joplin, you can sample his meat pies and sausage rolls for a dollar. So Missouri Southern is sponsoring Third Thursday tonight, downtown Joplin, uh, from 5.30 to 8.30. Uh, come down, try one of his meat pies for a dollar, or come back here tomorrow at noon for his talk and sample them for free. And if neither of those opportunities work out, come to Starbucks tomorrow night at 6, 3324 South Range Line, and you'll have another opportunity to sample meat pies and meet Mr. Wolf. I think it's really incredible how he ended up in, in Joplin. He's on the Great American Road Trip. Uh, he left LA on Sunday by car, um, drove to Salt Lake City, where he did a presentation and tasting on Monday, went on to Denver on Tuesday. Last night was in Wichita, uh, uh, meeting people and letting them sample his, his pies. Uh, left Wichita, got into Joplin at 1.30 this morning. So we have him uh, in Joplin for, for two full days. Then he goes on to St. Louis, Chicago, and Minneapolis. So he really is on the great American road trip. So, without further ado, let's bring up Mr. J.J. Wolfpie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Guten Tag, mein Kinderlach. I am from Austria. Australia. It's not Austria. Just checking, making sure on your toes. My name's JJ, as Dr. Chad Stebbings introduced me. I'm from Melbourne, Australia originally, 
and living the dream in LA right now, baking Australian products, which I'm hoping that all of you get to sample today and tomorrow. So that should be pretty good. So first of all, no Australian talks start without a big g'day. So can I get a g'day? g'day. That's pretty good. Be louder. G'day. G'day, mates. I don't know what I'm doing here. I've never spoken before. Dr. Chad over here calls me up out of the blue and asks me to talk in Australian culture. So the joke's on him because he's opened up a Pandora box. He's going to want clothes soon. But we'll just be patient over here. All right. Um, Scotty, slide two. Australia, in Australia, is not pronounced Australia. We call it Straya. S-T-R-A-Y-A. That's how you pronounce it. Straya. In, uh, in, in Australia, who's ever seen this, a movie about Australia? Anybody? Yeah, what? Uh, very romantic. <laughs> Australia. Yeah, there's, a, there's another one. It's a classic. It's called Finding Nemo. You see that one? Yeah, you remember the seagulls? Mate, 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 mate. That, that's us. We're, we call each other mate. That's what we call each other all the time. It's so bloody accurate. You know, if anybody gets sick of this speech and needs to walk out, if there's one thing you need to take out of Australian culture, it's mate. We're all about the mateship. Now, when we say mate, we're not talking about what you do at night time after school. Mate is friendship, and that's what we do in Oz, which is, uh, well, let me just give you an example. When we see somebody, we practically sing it. It's a song. G'day, mate. How you going, mate? Good, mate. Mate. Yeah, so we're, 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 all, we're all doing the mates all the time and our culture allows that we do not need to remember anybody's name. Mate. Hey, mate. 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 That's it. Now, we don't always, we don't always have to use mate as a friend. Sometimes it's getting a little bit aggressive too. For example, where are we up to? Let's slide three. For example, we go to the foot, we go to the cricket or the football, and anybody know what cricket is? Yeah, you know, well, do you know how long a cricket game lasts for? A test match in Australia, a cricket game goes for five days. What do you think we do? during five days of sitting down and watching the cricket. Hey, can you repeat that? Drink. drink. We drink a lot. And then when you consume a lot of liquids, what happens next? Yep. So this is cricket. You're watching somebody bowling, somebody batting, similar to baseball kind of deal in a huge ground. And you're sitting there, you're drinking a lot. Then you go to the urinal, and you still got a drink. And you're rocking, and somebody bumps into you from behind. <laughs> you splash it all over yourself. Yeah, mate, yeah, mate, wasn't me. Mate, look what you made me do. Like, no, no, mate, you went into the traffic. It's packed over here, mate. So the mate gets aggressive, but then you hear a loud cheer. Somebody just scored a six, that means they hit it out of the ground. And, mate, you hug each other or your best mates and she'll be right. That's what we say. It's all right. See, we're still very sexist in Australia. When things are good, we say she'll be right. You know, if it's something good, it's a she. So she'll be right. It's, it's an expression that we use. So, mates are 
a real part of what we do. Now, the other thing that we do answer when somebody says, is it your fault? The answer is no, but we don't say no in Australia. We say, yeah, nah. You pushed into me in the toilet. Yeah, nah. Or the opposite, nah, yeah, equals yes. Do I know what I'm talking about today? Nah, yeah, I do. That's a yes. No worries. It's another thing that we say a lot. It's our culture. We don't worry. The situation is not too bad. She'll be right, mate. So this is the lecture on Australian culture. It's built around friendship, and we call it the all-encompassing Aussie spirit. Scotty, mate. Next. Okay, who's familiar with the Australian flagship airline? It's called Qantas. It's got the kangaroo on the back. And if you see the slogan, it's the spirit of Australia. That's our slogan. So what is this spirit? This spirit, uh, who has ever flown on an American airline? United, yeah, Delta. What are, what are the stewardesses like on those flights? They're 70 year old, crabby, mean. God, God forbid you walk to the back, especially when you fly to Australia, you know how many hours it is? It's 14 hours nonstop, right? Okay, you want a drink. So you're walking to the back of the plane, and there they've curtained off the area, and they've marked their territory, and God forbid you disturb them because, you know, you just paid a couple of grand to get on the plane. And, oh, mate, can I have a drink? Excuse me, sir, get back to your seat. Seatbelt sights on. They're like, oh, I'm so thirsty. I'm going to call the captain. You have to go back to your seat. There are policies. Anyway, the same situation, if you're on Qantas, for example, so they're slightly less crabby and about 140 years younger, and they, they'll probably pour you a drink and say, here you go, mate, there's a, there's a spirit, there's a friendliness, and it's part of our culture. We do like to be sarcastic and make jokes of everybody and ourselves, but the friendliness, the mateship, that's our culture. Now, we weren't always this friendly. Our friendliness of mateship, the spirit and everything is relatively new. Anybody know our background? How did Australians start? Anybody? Convicts. Yes. We were thieves and murderers and pocket thieves. I don't know what we did. We bashed people a lot. That's what we did. Anyway, so... The English, they took their riffraff and they sent them to the land down under. Which all comes to show you, if you're going to get into a deal, do not invest blindly. Check out your investment before you go. Because fast forward a whole lot of years later, and you don't see the English outside Buckingham Palace saying, Oh, what a cute koala. Or... Look at the size and the kangaroo. Oh my God. No, you don't see that. You go to Australia, but, and you know what you're going to see? Let's flick through a little bit. Scotty, mate. We passed the convicts. Yeah, that's, that's what you're going to see in Australia. You're going to see magnificent beaches. The weather is beautiful. Keep on flicking, mate. Great Barrier Reef. We have two of the seven wonders of the world, natural wonders of the world, located in Australia. So that's up on the northern side of the coast. And the next slide, that's Ayers Rock. That's the biggest rock in the world. Another big natural phenomenon. So Australia's beautiful. Everywhere you go, there's rainforest, there's desert, there's beaches. Uh, it's, it's just a magnificent looking country. So we know that the English definitely screwed up that one a little bit. You know, they, they should have swapped it around. Sent their, sent their, moved, moved their holiday houses to Australia and sent their convicts back to England. Get the rain all the time. Anyway, back to our origin tales. So the English sent the convicts over and that's how Australia began. 
or did it? Yeah, no. The indigenous people of Australia are the Aboriginals. Scotty, mate? Yes. The Aborigines are probably the oldest known people to mankind when they study the bones and the skeletons that they find. So they've been there for thousands of years before white man ever stepped foot over there. And we took over, we meaning Caucasians that came, took over, took over their land, took over their culture for a lot of the part and pushed them to the side. And it's only really in recent generation that the Australian government has taken official stance in recognising the Aboriginal culture and a bit of payback. They haven't done what with, I live in California, and you know what Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger did when he was in power. Retribution for the American Indians, you give them a bloody casino. That's what you do. They haven't done that in Australia yet. That's what we need to do. I don't know if the Australian government will ever get to watch this, but we need to give them a casino. We'll call it the Boomerang Casino and Resorts. You leave broke, but you'll be back. That's the boomerang effect. Yeah. The spirits recently born. We have a culture of carefreeness. We say she'll be right a lot. That means no worries. All's well. All's good. And we throw in a little sarcastic stuff here too into everything that we say. We've had interesting leaders. We had a we, our president is called a prime minister. We had one bloke, his name was Harold Holt. Went for a swim one day and was never seen again. Yeah, you bet you would like to see that with some of your leaders here, right? <laughs> we, had, we, had, we had another leader who died very recently. Prime Minister, his name was Bob Hawke. Scotty, mate, flick through a couple. Let's get past the Aboriginal. Here we go. This man was a legend. He was a Prime Minister of Australia. He was in the Guinness Book of Records for sculling a yard of beer known as a sconce pot in 11 seconds, part of a traditional Oxford College penalty. Next, next slide, so we can see. There we go. Okay. Not trying to push alcohol here. Okay, that's not the point. The point is, the Australian culture, the leader has to be one of the people. That's what he is. He mingles and is part of it, and that's what they loved about this guy. He was one, you know, drink a beer, get in the Guinness Book of Records, and he talked like he was one of the people. He wasn't an elitist. And he was truly loved in Australia. When he passed away about a year, or less than a year ago, it was a big deal compared to other prime ministers in the past. And he summed up the irreverence of the Australian people with a little story that I'm going to share with you because it captures it captures the mindset of the Australian people when I say it a little bit sarcastic with a little bit of stuff you in it. So he says there was three blokes that they were hiking through the Amazon. It's in the middle of the summer. It's bloody boiling. They're sweating their titties off. They climb up to a top of a mountain to see if they can find any water. And they get to the top and there's this magnificent blue lagoon down below. Oh my God, they're so happy. There's three of them. There's an Australian, an Englishman, and a Frenchman. They run down the mountain, dive in the water, splashing about. The Englishman's probably got his head out doing that. And then after a minute, some local tribesmen come canoeing over, drag him out of the water, and bring him over to their camp. And they put him in front of the chief. The big chief comes and he says, you have wandered into our sacred water, for this you must die. Oh. We not only kill you, we skin you, and we make canoe with your skin. And we put in the water as a reminder for any trespasser not to go in our sacred waters. Before you die, I give you each one wish. You, Mr. Frenchman. Uh, I would like 
uh, knife, please. They give him a knife. He goes, I will not die by the hand of savages. Viva la France. <laughs> Dead. You, Englishman, what do you want? Oh, uh, jolly me, a cup of tea would be nice. But like my friend from across the channel, I think I'll take a knife too. I, I do not want to die by the hand of savages. Takes the knife. <laughs> Dead. You go to the Australian, okay, what would you like? Australia, what do you want? Oh, mate, can I have a fork? They give, they give him a fork. And he goes, Screw your canoe, try using that. <laughs> and that sums up the screw you nature and making a joke of things in a nutshell. That's the Australian people. All right, homework tonight is to see if you can put down one of those and how long it's going to take. I'll be checking with Chad Stevens tomorrow to see how well you guys do. It will be part of your grading. <laughs> All right, next, music. Music. Music is huge in Australia. Um, the music scene really exploded internationally in the 80s. Um, Anybody hear of this little band called the Beatles? Yeah? No, not Australian. But, but, how about ACDC? Yeah. Remember ACDC? They're pretty big. <laughs> um, Midnight Oil, In Excess, Men at Work, Come From The Land Down Under. It's a bit of an iconic Australian song. So they really put the Australian music onto the map and... Um, if we can get to the next slide. Oh, we can do that first. Yeah. Ne next, next one. How about this guy? Wolverine. We all love Wolverine, right? Australian. Yeah. We all so Australians made their mark in cinema too. And I mean, he's probably the most famous one of them right now. He's actually doing Broadway shows, Hugh Jackman. Doing singing and dancing. Is that incredible talent over there. Yeah. Next slide, Scotty. Kimbo. Um, yeah, Australians, we share a lot of the values that the American system does as well. I got Kimbo there, because can you imagine if you were in North Korea and like you college kids over here and the president comes along and you rip off your shirt and you've got hashtag not my president. You know what kimchi would do to you? If you did that in North Korea, he'd make you into kimchi. You know, you'd, 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 be, you'd be dead in a second. Next slide. Go to, the, go to the caliphate, the Islamic state, and say, oh, I, I have found Jesus. Uh, we're going to do love and this. Yeah, he turned to the Queen of Hearts, off with his head, if you were to say that over there. You could not bend from their direction. Or next slide, Scotty, mate. Iran. Imagine if the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister there needs the Ayatollah's permission to become, the, to run in a fair election in Iran. Imagine if you wanted to be an openly gay prime minister in Iran. Oh, but Mr. Ayatollah, we had so much fun last night. We can't do it publicly. No, no, no. That would not be allowed. So, well, one more slide. France. Imagine in France if they wanted to legalise deodorant. It just says, would not happen, would not happen. Not allowed. So... Billions of people live in oppressed countries around the world and, you know, people bitch about our government all the time, but at the end of the day, we're the bloody bosses and we're the board of directors and we don't like who's running the country, we get to kick them out every four years. That's the beauty of freedom. Next slide. And... Australia, like America, we stand for freedom. You know, in fact, we've sent our soldiers 
to every single war joining Americans, whether it was the World Wars, Vietnam, Afghanistan, um, Iraq. Australians die alongside the Americans and we literally, we will go and fight for freedom. We share that core value. It's very important to us. Oh, you're meant to give a huge ovation at this point, you know. Very patriotic. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. USA, USA. All right. Uh, next, next slide. I think when a lot of you think of about Australia, the first thing that comes to mind is the unique animals. The cute koala bears, the kangaroos. I don't know if you know this guy. This one's a platypus. This is proof that marijuana was legalised in heaven before creation. <laughs> God was a little bit high there. Took a beaver, stuck a duck bill on it, <laughs> made it a good swimmer, yet it lives on land, lays eggs. Yeah, we have, we, we have, we have really, really cute animals and they're all over the place in Australia. We also have the deadliest animals. Australia has snakes and spiders, Scotty. We've got, we've got things that'll kill you in a heartbeat. We have also a oh, ton of sharks around the place. Shark, it's another Australian word. It's combined of two words. Shark. <laughs> you can imagine what that is. That, um, yeah, it's, we, you go to Australia, you expect dangerous animals um, when you go over there. Here's some other Australian words that I think you should be knowing about. Thongs. I wear thongs. They're airy. They're breathing. I feel good in them. Yeah, thongs are flip-flops. That's what we call flip-flops, okay? And in Australia, often, it's the best pair of shoes in the house. You know, you know, everybody walks around in thongs. Why is it even called a flip-flop? I mean, what are you flipping? It sounds like a burger or something. Another one, oh, in Australia, you know how in America people drive, especially as I'm driving through middle America, everybody's got big, bloody cars. We have their little... Japanese things in Australia, you know, nobody sees the big American cars. Um, if somebody was to go there and say, oh, they're talking about their Cadillac Escalade and they're telling their Australian audience what a massive car it is and it's got this huge, huge trunk. If you were to say to somebody, oh, mate, I've got a huge trunk, they'd look at you like, well, that's impressive. <laughs> How big is it? <laughs> or, or, or if it's a Sheila, you should probably slap you across the face and tell you where you can shove your trunk. You know, it, a trunk is a boot. You go to Australia, you talk about the size of your boot, not the trunk. Rubber. A rubber is something you bring to class. Oh, Mrs. Jones. Yeah, I forgot my rubber. I broke it last night. Oh, oh, oh you're going to be staying after class and I'll be speaking to your parents about that. You come to class with a rubber. A rubber is an eraser. Okay, that's what we call them. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, words that change from Australia to here. Let's, um, let's flick the next slide. Let's talk food. We call food tucker. Now, tucker is spelt T-U-C-K-E-R. If it's got E-R at the end, it's pronounced ah, U-H. So, let's try this together. It's night time. You're bloody starving. You go home and prepare dear. Oh, sa, pa, dear, na, U-H at the end. That's how you do it. All right. You're, well, give yourself a big clap also. Missouri, you got it right over there. Give yourself a hand, okay? Especially this bloke over here. This guy in the front, he got it right. 
not that kind of hand. Yeah. Um, goes on. Sister, brother, mother, father. You can combine it together. Mother, father. So everything's got a UH at the end of it. We shorten a lot of words to E. Hence, an Australian is an Aussie. Mosquito, mozzie. You heard of the phrase shrimp on the barbie? Not Australian. We don't even call them shrimps, we call them prawns. That was a, I think that was, that was from a um, Crocodile Dundee movie they made it famous. Shrimps on the barbie. We basically take any word that has about three syllables and chop it up into a one syllable. So avocado is an avo. Bottle shop, bottle loaf. So everything is, everything is a shortened word. We only have one Kylie in Australia, and the last name's not Jenna. It's Minogue. Nothing to do with Lippy. In food, we start with brekkie in the day, which, next slide, this is probably the most iconic Australian food, besides the meat pies that you're going to taste, that every Australian is very, very proud of. It's called Vegemite. Vegemite is a salty spread that you honestly have to try to understand. You'll never taste anything like it. We put it on toast. I mean, you can have it any, day, any time of the week, any time of the day, but it's a breakfast spread. And no Australian who's got any Australian pride would ever not have that to eat. So it's something that I have to talk about and mention today. You're done with brekkie. Let's say you're a tradesperson, we call a tradie, a trucker, a truckie, and it's 10 a.m. Time for a coldie. That's a cold beer. We don't say beer. It's not B-E-R, it's B-E-U-Y-U-H. B-E-R, that's how you pronounce it. So, we don't drink Fosters. That's an American myth. Good advertising there. We have tuck shops at lunchtime. Next slide. Milk bar. That's where we buy whatever we need. That's our 7-Elevens. They're called milk bars. In there you'll find a heat box with pies and sausage rolls and uh, next slide, newspapers, whatever you need, you get at the milk bar. So it's pronounced bar like a sheep. Bar, milk bar. That's how you pronounce a milk bar. Ah. Uh, so the sausage rolls, the pies that you're going to taste later, they're everywhere. You go to the football, you go to the cricket, you go to one of these places, you go to a frozen section of a supermarket. It's, it's part of the Australian culture, it's part of the food that we eat. If you ever do go to Australia and you ask for a pie, no, you're not getting a pizza, you're not getting an apple pie, you're going to be getting meat in it. Another big part of our culture is sports. Sports is a way we identify ourselves. You cannot go to Australia without saying, oh, who do you go for? Now, you guys are Lions fans, correct? Yeah, yeah come Lions! <laughs> That's what we say. And I'm a Magpie Collingwood fan, so flick the next slide. Um, can we play that? This is real football, in case you're wondering. Okay, yeah. In Australia, we call it football because we actually kick the ball. We, we catch the ball, we tackle, you know, it's, it's the main sport of southern Australia, the northern one and central, they, pay, they play rugby. But this is our passion. You cannot be Australian without getting into this. So, you know, I want you to yeah, try it out a bit. Oh, nearly. Here, yeah, grab the ball. No, I'll get it, don't worry. You just stay there. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. You're not, you're not allowed to throw a ball. You've got to hand pass it. Good catch. Pass it around. Get a feel of pig skin. This is, this is an Australian ball. And while you're at it, I want a bit of a memento of Joplin. So write a little message on it too and pass around here, here's a marker. Catch. 
Ugh. Okay, you might not be making the football team. Check this out. So you're running, the ground is about five times the size of American football field. A goal is the centre post. You're not allowed to run without bouncing it every 15 metres. So an average player might be running 10 to 15 miles in a game. See how we pass it? You've got to pass it by punching it. And it's a running game, it's a physical game. There's tackling. It's not played anywhere else in the world. There's one American player, actually, that plays, his name's Mason Cox. He's seven foot tall, he was in a basketball background. And they imported him to Australia to play the game. But that's something you just want to just Google at some point and check out Aussie Rules Football. It's, it's, a, it's a completely different experience. We do also have um, rugby that they play, but um, that's sort of softball to baseball, netball to basketball, so we won't talk about that today. Now, do you notice the big bloke over there who's signing the ball right now? <laughs> the ball, when it bounces, well, we do have skills, so we can kick the ball straight. But when the ball bounces, the shape of the ball, it really can go anywhere. There's, you've got to be able to expect anything, which is true of our life, isn't it? You know, you've got to be able to adjust and bounce. You know, Chad was saying, I used to be in the clothing business. So I was manufacturing clothing and baking was my hobby. And I really didn't enjoy it. But things went south when um, retail didn't, when Amazon got big. And the retailers, I used to sell to these shops called Hot Topic and Charlotte Russe and Junior, Junior Chains, Rue 21. And they struggled because the mall business struggled. Everybody's buying online. And it was just time that I had to do a change, so I got my hobby into it. But, you know, it's like in America, they say life throws you curveballs, and you just got to bounce up and deal with it. We spoke about the casualness and the friendliness of the Australian food scene. We also have a tremendous coffee scene, um, which basically comes out of our European, Greek, Italian influence. So you cannot go anywhere in Australia without getting a great cup of coffee. Starbucks failed in Australia. Honestly, they opened up a hundred and something stores, they had to close them down. I think there's one or two left. So everywhere you go, the coffee's fantastic. The, the breakfast at the coffee shops, it's not a piece of refrozen something that they're going to heat up for you. It's a, the breakfast spreads at every coffee shop is fantastic. It's cooked by chefs, not by just somebody who's reheating. So it's a really nice experience. You see people sitting down, laid back, reading the newspapers, usually the back pages. Australia has a culture of horse racing. They love gambling, the Australians. And so there's pages dedicated to the horse races. You often see, especially the elderly, on the racing guide and the newspapers flicking through, sitting down, drinking their coffee. That's a picture of Australia in the morning. Anybody know how big Australia is? Compared to America, it's about the same size. It's massive. Thing is, we've only got 25 million people there. So because of the small population that's sprinkled around the coast, it has that smaller town vibe that I feel when I come to small cities like this, you know, you get a lot more of the friendliness that you miss out if you were to be in New York and Los Angeles that you can easily get a bit lost over there. So Australia does have that friendship circle that you feel in your communities over there a lot. And you also, I guess, miss out on the conveniences. 6 p.m., shops are shut. You need to fill in your prescription and it's 6.03 p.m., good luck, mate. You're not getting it. You're waiting until tomorrow. We have a very diverse population, Greeks, Italians, Lebanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, Indians. It's a, it's, it really is a very big multicultural spread. Um, yeah, let's flick to the next. I'm going to give you a little bit of, like, here I am talking about Australia. So 
who, where am I? Who am I from? I've got to tell you the story of four people. Johanna was a German. Her family were very, very proud Germans. Her dad was one of the people that invented, well, was part of inventing a modern typewriter. And when the Nazis came, she was in Brussels and she got sent over with her family to Auschwitz. Her family were all guests. Um, she was the longest living woman that survived in Auschwitz death camp. She was there for four years till the end. At the end, in fact, she was, have you heard of Dr. Mengele? He was one of the head Nazis that Hitler had who loved to experiment on people. And she actually had an encounter with him that he cut out her tonsils once and threw it out. And the, she said the only reason she survived was because other people in the camp would take, it was snowing at the time, and they shoved snow down her throat to try to stop the bleeding. At the end of the Holocaust, the, they were sent to a hospital in Brussels where she was there for one year. After one year, she's walking the street, or she was in a bus, I'm not sure the exact details, and she sees her brother on the street in a different country. You know, she fainted on the spot. So her brother never knew she was alive. She never knew her brother were alive. They were the only survivors. Her brother had a connection to Australia, so he was able to get sponsored, and then he eventually sponsored her. And she was about 26 years old. She came to Australia, worked as a dressmaker. Beryl. Beryl was in a country called Vilna. Vilna is a place that's on the border of Russia and Poland. His family, uh, I think they were the caretakers of a synagogue, a Jewish church. And he was visiting his family. He was married. He had a child. He was visiting his family when the Nazis came in. And they killed all his family, including his wife, his child, his parents. And he managed to escape somehow. I don't know the exact details of that either. And then he spent the rest of the war in Lithuania and he would look for bodies to give them decent burials. That's what he did for all the years of the World War II. Kina. Kina, she was in a Polish family in Krakow and her family were, they had a bit of money and her dad was pretty cluey, and when the war started, he converted all his money and assets into jewellery. They, they got hidden by a non-Jewish Gentile family in Krakow, and they lived in an attic for all the years of the war, and he would pay the people weekly with jewellery, which is still pretty surprising because most people in that situation would have turned them in just out of fear, because if you got caught doing such a thing, I mean, you're dead instantly or if you're not sent to a labour camp and then killed. So that's how they survived. And then lastly, Pinnock. Pinnock, as a young man, I think he was 17, he got taken to a concentration camp and he escaped. And he doesn't talk about it ever. He tells a lot of stories, but he never talks about how he escaped from concentration camp. And we believe because the concentration camp has a policy, they do roll calls in the morning. And if one person is missing, they'd line up 10 people, boom, 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 dead. So if you do escape, it's a, it's a heavy burden that you do carry knowing that you killed a bunch of others. And I think that's the reason why he didn't talk about it. He lived in the forest after that and was a fighter in an underground movement over there, smuggling guns and looking for Nazis for however many years. He was a friend of Pope John Paul. In fact, they used to play soccer together in Poland as kids. And 
when he moved to Australia years later, he saw Pope John Paul on the TV one day, and I don't know what his Polish nickname was. He said, what? His Pope? He loved girls. <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't get over it. But he said he was, a, he was an unbelievable bloke. Um, anyway, Johanna mated with Beryl. Kinna mated with, with Pinnock. My parents are born in Australia. And here's this bald beauty over here as a result. So that's, that's my multicultural background that brings me, which is just typical of what Australia is all about. People who come from everywhere and enter a place that's an island, you know, you're cut off from everything and you form a happy society that, yeah, things could be tough a little bit, but we're going to laugh about it and we're going to have humour about it. Anyway, lastly, we'll take some questions, but very important, at the end of every talk, we do this. When I say Aussie, you say oi. Let's, let's do a practice run. Aussie! Oi. Aussie, Aussie! Oi, oi. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie! Oi, oi. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie! Oi, oi. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Aussie! Aussie! Aussie, Aussie, Aussie! Fantastic. Well done. You all pass. A plus. Chad's left. A plus for everyone. All right, anybody got a question? No? Okay, beers are in the van. I parked on the side. Help yourselves. And I hope to see all of you later. You can try some pies. All right? Thank you very much.